hello everybody. It's uh, six thirty here on the east coast of the U.S. and I want to welcome all of you to uh, another really interesting EdChat interactive. Uh, this one is with Randall and Dolores Lindsay on the how tos behind cultural proficiency. Uh, this is actually a passion of mine because it's it's amazing how many how many times we're communicating with another person and we think the things are going smoothly and they're processing the information different from what we expect and what results can, can be a disaster. And uh, the, the Lindsay's have been studying that and, and talking about it for about 20 years. So this, this, should, this is actually a really uh, pertinent topic and a really personal one for me. Um, we do have a few, uh, re, a few other interesting sessions coming up. Um, tonight, obviously, we have the Lindsay's. Um, April 13th, we have Steve Piha. He's, teach, he's been teaching a series on, um, on writing, and his next one is on how to teach expository, uh, persuasive, and argumentative writing. Uh, he's, he's also a very dynamic speaker. And then on April 19th, we have Zachary Walker coming back. He's been talking about EdTech tools. He's actually going to be talking to us from Singapore. And he's going to be talking about how to use a back channel uh, for discussions in class. You can use a back channel to document what you talked about. You can use a back channel to find out what students are thinking. There's a, there's a number of different uses of, of back channels. He's also always very interesting. And uh, right now, I'd like to, uh, to introduce the, the Lindsay's. Um, so, so I just, you know, Randall Lindsay has dedicated his 50 year, uh, sorry, uh, Randall Lindsay has de dedicated his fifth career to building bridges of understanding in different cultures within communities, especially in K-12 education. He began working on issues of race and social justice and equity during the civil rights movement as a consultant to school districts focusing on desegregation. He has served as a junior and senior high school history teacher, a district office administrator for school desegregation, and executive director of a nonprofit corporation. Today, Randall Lindsay is Emeritus Professor at California State University in Los Angeles and continues to consult on issues related to educational equity and access. For his career-long service to education, he's the recipient of this year's Living Legends Award from the National Council of Professors of Educational Administration. That's pretty incredible. And Dolores Lindsay is retired as Associate Professor of Education at Cal State San Marcos but did not retire from the education profession. As a former middle and high school teacher, assistant principal, principal, and county office of education administrator, her primary focus is on developing cultural proficient leadership practices aimed at closing educational gaps. As an educational consultant, she helps educational leaders examine their organization's policies and practices and their individual beliefs and values about cross-cultural communications. Along with Raymond Terrell and Kikansa Nuri Robbins, Randall and Dolores Lindsay are the authors of a body of work on cultural proficiency that spans more than a dozen books, 14 online courses, and a multifaceted model of professional learning for personal and organizational change. So I'm just thrilled to have Randall and Dolores here today to share with us their wisdom and best practices, and let me bring them up to the stage. So you never told me about this about your old. That that's pretty incredible. Congratulations! <laughs> wow. He's a recognized as a living legend, and most of the time he's just a legend in his own mind. It's <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say thank you, so, Mitch. I'm, yeah, I'm, not, I'm I'm glad that you know how to put somebody in their place. <laughs> so um, so I can I can bring myself down, and I'll I'll bring your slides up, okay? And then just tell me if you thank want me you. to bring my back up. Thank you. Well, thanks, uh, Mitch. And uh, we're really enjoying this uh, platform, uh, Shindig, uh, as a way to bring you this webinar today. And welcome to our home. We live in uh, Escondido, California, near uh, California State University of San Marcos. Uh, Randy and I are delighted to be with you today. Uh, we're talking about uh, the title of the webinar is the How To's of Cultural Proficiency. And we've designed some participant outcomes uh, for you today. And these are really the 
participant outcomes, you'll see them on the first slide here, um, the participant outcomes that we usually design for uh, the uh, sessions when we work with schools and with districts and organizations on their journey toward cultural proficiency. Um, our participants learn about four fundamental tools. Uh, these are tools for change within the context of today's schools, the complexity of today's educational environment. Uh, participants will see, uh, you'll see your role in narrowing and closing the access and educational gaps. You'll become familiar with appropriate use of the cultural proficiency library, the, the books and the e-courses um, that Mitch was talking about. And you'll deepen your understanding that leads to actions as leverage points for personal and organizational change. And this is what we'll talk about as we move through the webinar today, uh, some uh, how-tos or moving toward action uh, for your journey toward change through the lens of cultural proficiency. On the next slide, Terry's, uh, Terry Cross will be introduced to us. Uh, when Kakanza and Ray and I started the first book, one of the things that we were looking for was a delivery system for addressing issues of inequity in our country. And we had looked at lots of different models. And in about 1987, we discovered Terry Cross's work. We never do a presentation or a professional writing where we don't thank him because he's actually, he and his colleagues were the ones that, that were the originators of this concept. Uh, Terry's a member of the Seneca Nation. He was raised in upper upstate New York. Um, as a professional, he settled in Portland, Oregon, where he uh, created and ran a, a social service agency for the larger community of Portland. Um, his work around cultural competence was started because of the fact that the models they were using in cross-cultural communities didn't work with all communities equitably. And so at a meeting with the National Institute of Mental Health, they, they complained the fact that the models at that time didn't work and were challenged by the directors at that time to go out and develop a model that did work. And so over the next couple of years, he and colleagues from across the United States, and I understand from Canada, started uh, putting together a cross-cultural program that would work. And out of this came a, a systematic cross-cultural competency program. Um, we discovered, uh, Ray and Kakanza each separately discovered that the, that the first manuscript, we took a look at it and said, this is exactly what we needed. So we approached him and asked him what he would charge us to take his, his product and turn it into an education represented model. And I still remember his words to this point. He says, just do no harm. And so it's with that, uh, we, we present with you the work of Terry Cross through the lens of education. In this next slide, what you'll see are a number of people who are the co-authors on the variety of books that we have, the 14 titles at this point. As Dolores and I walk through this uh, seminar with you, we will use the pronoun we an awful lot today. We want you to recognize the fact that we is a large community of people. And so this becomes an important part that as you hear our voices, you're actually hearing the voices of about 25 people. On the next slide, you see a, a book by Margaret Wheatley. The title of this book is Turning to One Another, Simple Conversations to Restore Hope to the Future. Those of you who know Margaret Wheatley, you know that she's a systems thinker. Uh, she's a scientist and she's written extensively on um, uh, systems as organization, organizations as systems and how organizations function. And uh, she wrote this book uh, shortly after September the 11th, 2001, uh, her fear that as, uh, as a nation and as people, we would become so afraid of each other because of the terrorist attacks in the United States that we would just turn away from each other. We would just be so afraid of each other. We would fragment ourselves in, in fear. And so she wrote this little book called Turning to One Another and um, she said that sometimes we we go to conferences and we attend seminars just for what we as individuals could can get out of it. And, and she said we need to really focus on conversation and in communities, focus on conversation. So when Randy and I and, and others as cultural proficiency uh, consultants and educators start our seminars, we always look to Margaret Wheatley's work. And I'm just going to um, read a little bit from her work today just to set the tone for our webinar. 
she says that for conversation to take us to a d deeper realm, she believes we have to start with some basic principles. She says that when we are together, we uh, realize how wise we can be together rather than thinking as individuals. She says that we acknowledge one another as equals. We try to stay curious about each other. We recognize that we need each other's help to become better listeners. We slow down so that we have time to think and reflect. We remember that conversation is the natural way that humans think together. And we expect it to be messy at times. So we're going to take you into a little bit of that messiness now with Mitch's help. Um, this is an activity that we do with our groups uh, just to help us get uh, acquainted with each other. And then we'll debrief this activity with you in just a few minutes. So as a participant today, we're going to ask you to uh, engage in this activity with us. It's called uh, What's in a Name? I'm going to model this activity. Uh, we ask participants to uh, engage with two or three other participants um, in the uh, with the activity. Uh, somebody that you might know well uh, today is going to be people across the webinar, people you may have never met before. And you're going to share your complete name, your preferred name, who gave you your name, and how you experience your name, and how you think others might experience your name. So I'm going to model activity, and then Mitch is going to tell us how you might uh, find a person uh, in the room and uh, pair up with that person and talk about your name story. So um, I have five names. My name is Dolores Faye Broom Harp Lindsay. Now Dolores is spelled D-E-L-O-R-E-S. And I know there's a, a Latina spelling, D-O-L-O-R-E-S. And I also know that um, there, Dolores is a uh, African-American female name, uh, usually in the South. Now, those of you that cannot see us this today, I'll just identify myself as a white woman. And so uh, sometimes when people see my name first and they do not see me, they're not sure uh, who they're going to meet when I, when we actually meet. Uh, am I Latina? Am I African American? Uh, they can usually tell if they hear me speak that I'm Southern, and so they're really not sure who they're going to meet. I'm very proud of my name because uh, my mother gave me my name, and it was actually her name, so very proud of my name. Uh, I've always gone by the name Dolores. No shortened form of it, no DD or D, uh, just the name Dolores and very proud of it. Um, the name Faye, F A Y E, uh, my mom gave me that name as well because it was her best friend at the, na at the time I was born. So I was named for my mom's BFF if they had such a thing then. And then my last name, Harp, H A R P was the name of my uh, former husband. And it's still an important name in my life because it's the name of the two children that we have. And then uh, well, I skipped a name, didn't I? Broom, B-R-O-O-M, uh, my father's name. So a very important name, a family name for me. And then I told you about the name Harp. And then my last name, Lindsay. And uh, if you do not know, Randy and I, are not only co-authors, uh, we cohabitate here in this home in San Marcos, and we're very good friends and lovers and husband and wife. So that's my last name. So uh, it's interesting, the last three names that I have, Broom, Harp, and Lindsay, are, uh, it will indicate the influence of the men in my life, my father's name, and my former husband, and Randy Lindsay. So those of us uh, women sometimes take on the names of um, the, the fathers uh, in our lives and then uh, the names of our husbands. So that's my name story. And uh, Mitch, if you can suggest ways that folks can connect with each other 
and uh, for just about four or five minutes, uh, share their name stories with each other. Can you help us out here? Okay, so so this is a time to share, and I think your name is an important part of each of our culture and and who we are. So uh, th so if you if you have a webcam and if you have a microphone, click on the avatar of another person and the story of what's your complete name, what do you prefer to be called, who gave you your name, how do you get your names, how do you experience your name, and how do you think others ex experience your name. Um, I have uh, 652 on my computer, so at 655, I think we're going to be coming back. And um, so you've got three minutes, and I'll pull myself down and give you a chance. If you don't have an, if you don't have a webcam, um, put that information into the IM and share it to the other with the other pe people in your room. And we'll be back in a minute. Okay, let me bring back the Lindsays. And hi. Okay, so what? As, as people are doing this, what do they learn from, from sharing their name story? Can you hear me? One of the things oh. that, one of the reasons we do, yes, uh -huh. the reasons that we engage folks in this activity is the obvious, so they get to know each other. But this really brings culture into the room long before we start talking about diversity or race or ethnicity or gender. Um, it really brings culture in the room. It brings everybody in the room. So um, if we're working with 50 people in the room or 500 people in the room, everybody has a chance to speak and everybody has a chance to be heard. There's no yeah. right answer, wrong answer. It's a name story, so it's personalized. And then we ask people to talk about what it felt like to share their name story. And we ask folks to talk about what it felt like to hear someone else's name story. So in some cases, it's a very emotional uh, time for people to connect with their culture, with their history. We have folks talk about um, being adopted and an important uh, moment for them to share their, um, maybe not knowing uh, much about their history, uh, uh, talking about uh, foster care students. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's wide open for everyone to participate in this activity. So it really brings everyone into the room. And it's one of those how-tos that we talked about. It's how do you bring culture in the room and engage folks early on uh, in any of the sessions to talk about self and to engage in others because cultural proficiency is about who I am. It's the inside out approach. Who am I in relation to others? So we get started with this activity, uh, bringing this forward really early uh, in the workshops and in the sessions. To apologize to all of the, the people. I actually came up a little bit early and uh, Jamie uh, Bisa, or I hope that's I'm pronouncing your name correctly, called me on that, and it's my fault. Um, um, it is. So. It's a yeah. It's a very rich activity, and we usually give people oh seven or eight minutes, and then have to expand it a little bit in our sessions because uh, people really want to hear other people's stories, and uh, we've had people say. I'll be back in a minute. I'm going to call my mom. I want to know more about my story. Um, uh, sometimes it can be uh, folks will will say, you know, I thought I knew everybody in the room. If we work with a an intact group, a faculty um, or a leadership team, and they'll say, you know, I thought I knew everybody in the room, and here I realize I didn't really know the significance of my my colleagues' names. Um, and the cultural connection uh, that I, the names would have. And I'm thinking that for, it, for teachers in their classroom or for principals or administrators in their schools, starting off the year doing something like this kind of creates a culture within the classroom or a culture within the school, correct? I can build on that. All three activities that we're doing today are in the Manual for School Leaders, in which they're in their lesson plan format. And the important thing about the work of cultural efficiency is it does not require a consultant to do the work. Uh, all the books are written in such oh, a way that you can actually pick what them you, up. What and are do we going to do? <laughs> <laughs> it still creates a lot of opportunities. Um, 
we, we came up with a new acronym you may have heard of called NCLB, No Consultant Left Behind. <laughs> <laughs> but what we find is that the, the work of, of diversity, the work of anti-racism, the work of equity is a very challenging conversation for a lot of people. So the first two activities, the one we just modeled and the one we're going to describe next, are sort of having the conversation uh, to have conversation before you have the deeper conversation. And so it's really okay, important. And I'll bring myself easier. down so you can move on to it. Okay, cool. Yeah. So the, this slide um, coming up really talks about what you can do uh, within your own school, within your own group. Um, select uh, some of the cultural proficiency books that really meets your needs. Uh, all of our consulting, while we're talking about consulting, is really custom design uh, based on the needs of the, the school, the community, the district. The books are written so that they're in a journal format. Uh, there's content and then there are uh, journal question, reflection questions, and there are sections that we call going deeper. Um, you can engage with your colleagues in a book study, there are book study guides with the books, and then there are dialogic um, activities where you can engage um, with your colleagues, um, even in the, the reflection questions are there, and also in an inquiry, uh, kind of an action research uh, model uh, to focus on the uh, equity approach to access and achievement disparities. And the way that you do this, of course, it would be using the four tools of cultural proficiency. And that's what we're going to introduce to you now. Um, these are um, four unique tools. Um, we usually start with the barriers, so there's no particular order to them. But most folks confront barriers in doing the work of equity and access. Uh, we address four particular barriers, and then to um, counter those barriers, we introduce to you then the, um, the guiding principles. Uh, the guiding principles are a set of core values. And uh, without these core values, um, you're going to have a pretty difficult time implementing culturally proficient practices. So these are the underlying values. And then the third tool that we will introduce to you today is called the continuum. And the continuum is really the language for de describing a healthy uh, organization or a not so healthy organization and a productive organization or a not so productive uh, organization through the policies and practices that we would examine. And then the fourth tool would be the real how to's, the real action verbs of what it is you're doing aligned with what you say you're doing. And these would be the uh, essential elements for culturally competent behavior. So these are the four tools. And we'll go over each of them just very briefly today. But if we were with your school or your district, this would be the work over, in some cases, two days to get into the tools. And then uh, as the school or the district does their work, this is over two to three years. Uh, as the work unfolds into the action, action steps and action planning that you would be doing. So the next step, next slide, we introduce a series of questions. And these are the key questions of the work of cultural competence and cultural proficiency. And if you notice there, they use the same uh, four tools of cultural proficiency. But uh, as you pick up a book and use it, or as you work with your colleagues, or as you have external people work with your school, these are the questions we think that are really significant to be building into a professional learning activity. Uh, and one is to take a look at, and we always talk about cultural proficiency at multiple levels. There's myself as the educator, there's my school or my school district, there's also the larger system. And so it's always the inside out, I'm taking a look at my behavior, I'm also taking a look at my school and my school district. So taking a look, what are the barriers that exist within our school that create disproportionality or that, that support disproportionality or support uh, access and opportunity gaps or achievement gaps. Then we take a look at what our, our stated mission and vision and core values are, and to what extent do they align around closing those kinds of gaps that we've been able to document in our society. Third, and this is the point we're going to spend some time with in a couple of minutes, is what are the unhealthy and healthy behaviors, uh, the language, the behaviors, the policies and practices that exist within our school. And then once we've identified and had those kind of conversations, and what standards do we have 
to uh, measure our progress and to, to really initiate action within a school. And then, of course, the last one is the qualitative one, and that is to what extent are we satisfied with student learning outcomes? Um, as Mitch mentioned in the beginning, I've been in this business for quite a while, and it's, it's refreshing to finally find on our, on our, our desktops, we're actually talking about student achievement across uh, racial and ethnic groups. We've been dodging the bullet for several generations in our country. And starting with No Child Left Behind, um, one of the silver linings of No Child Left Behind is he made the achievement gap public. And so in this last part of my career, it's refreshing to see that that fifth question is one that's really driving a lot of professional learning conversations in our schools and our universities. So the next slide, we will start and get into the uh, tools of cultural efficiency. Well, describing what cultural proficiency is, we've, we've talked about it as that inside-out approach, and it's it's about being aware of who we are, uh, how we work with individuals in our schools, and how we respond to people who are different from we are from who we are. It's about visible differences and and even the differences that we cannot see, um, and preparing our students to live in that world of difference. Um, and then um, going on to the slide, we're going to move along pretty quickly here. If you go to the slide, Mitch, that shows the magnifying glass, uh, yes, sometimes people say, well, we don't have time to do one other thing. We are overworked and overloaded. And so we describe that cultural proficiency is not an, a thing that you add on. It's the lens through which you do your current work. So if you could just imagine that magnifying glass or the set of glasses like these I'm wearing that I keep seeing the reflection of the window in over there. But it's the, the lens through which you examine everything you're doing. So your school site plan, your discipline plan, your resource plan, uh, everything that you're doing, you put on the lens of cultural proficiency and ask, is this a culturally proficient school-wide plan? Is this a culturally proficient discipline plan? So it's the lens through which, and you use those four tools to examine everything else that you're doing. So that's why we present to you these four tools, learning them. Now, of course, you learn the vocabulary, you, you learn the common terms, uh, and then you're able then to do the work that you're doing using these four tools. So let's take a look at the four tools. We're going to describe three of them and actually have you engage with one of them. Oh, I got ahead of myself. Yes. Yeah, we want to do this other activity or describe this activity yeah. anyway. The cultural perceptions. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, one of the things in the books that we uh, describe often is the the skill of reflection and dialogue, and um, we take time for people to reflect on their own thinking and talk with each other. Reflection is the, the conversation that you have with self, and it takes time. You have to set aside time to do it, and it's your thinking about your own thinking, the metacognition that takes place. And then dialogue uh, is a skill to be developed. It's not just sitting around talking. It's um, engaging in conversation towards shared understanding. It's not about making decisions. Uh, it's about reaching shared understanding. Um, if we're talking about state standards, if we're talking about um, uh, kinds of instructional strategies, are we talking a common language? Uh, do we have the same thing in mind when we describe English learning students, or students learning an additional language? When we talk about students being underperforming, uh, whose responsibility is that? So. We can talk about those things in dialogue session. So they really take a skillful uh, discussion guided by skillful facilitators. And these are fundamentals to probing uh, understanding in our organizations about our policies and practices, especially around issues of equity and access and opportunity gaps. So each of the books is structured to facilitate and foster reflection on dialogue. So I'm going to describe an activity now. I wish we had time to actually do it with you. It's a high energy activity. It builds on the first activity. If you've read Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blank, then you'll understand this uh, activity quite readily. 
um, what you do is you pair people up, you could be standing or seated, and they actually follow this protocol. One person is A and one person is B, and I always start with B just to make it fun. And on the next slide, there are seven prompts. And the way that the, that you go, there you go. So I asked the B person to describe how they think the A person would respond if the A person could talk. But the A person is to take on the, the attitude of the sphinx. They're to say nothing. They're to sit there and give no feedback. And it's really challenging to watch them do that. But they go through it in about two minutes. And then the person sort of unfreezes, gives correct answers. Then they switch roles. And then the A person describes the B person while the B person has taken on the role of the sphinx. Uh, what you ask people to do at the end of that is talk about what did it feel like to be in that role of the describer. And what you get are people that were that are experiencing a little bit of anxiety. It didn't want to stereotype, didn't want to judge. And it makes for a rich conversation. And even though people don't want to stereotype and don't want to judge, when they take a look at their, their thought patterns, they in fact have done that. So we try to identify the fact that <clears throat> assumptions are natural and normal. And probably the most important part of the inside out process of cultural efficiency is beginning to understand one's own assumptions. Because once we understand our assumptions, then we start taking a look at our own behavior. And the inside out process of cultural efficiency is not about so much about learning about the cultures of other kids or other communities, all of which is very important. But the context that we take it is how do you respond and what are your assumptions about that student, about that culture, about that kind of a dynamic that might be in your classroom in your community. Uh, the assumption part is very important because that's the individual part. Now, once, once people get into the work of cultural efficiency, then you also have to take a look, what are the assumptions built into policies and practices? Because all policies and practices are built on some assumptions, usually the previous generation. What we uncover in schools that we have worked with, particularly if they have changing demographics, is very often the assumptions that guide our curriculum and instruction patterns are built on the assumptions of previous demographic group of students. And once people make that connection, uh, it becomes a real healthy conversation. So these first two activities, what's in a name and cultural perceptions, are a really efficient way of, of people coming together in community to take an, and understand that, that everyone has culture, all of us who come into the community have culture, and we all have assumptions. At this point, then, we can actually begin talking about in depth the, the tools of cultural proficiency. We might spend a couple of hours at this point going with these two activities and debriefing them, uh, but it creates a nice community and at which point then we can systematically talk about the four tools. So with that, we're going to, to start that process. And the barriers to cultural efficiency are the most complex of the four tools. And, and when I'm doing the training, I always start with these tools. And I always start this way, and if we had time, I would engage you in that kind of activity. I ask people in, in the group to raise your hands if you think that, that it's somewhere in the history of the United States racism existed. And people look at me like I've lost my mind, and they giggle. I say to me, has in the past? I say, okay, has. And so they answer the question, so they do. And I say, how many think that, that, that the system of racism has tentacles into today? Everyone says they do. Then I ask the same question about sexism. Then I ask the same question about the social class uh, distinctions. Then I ask the same question about heterosexism. And by this point, you know, it, it, you've introduced four really important concepts. And then the, the point that we try to, to elicit from the group is if we can, as, as educated peoples in this room, agree that the isms have existed historically and still persist, then we also have to, to understand that some people lost rights and privileges because of those systems, of those oppressive systems. If people lose rights and privileges, they, and they, they accrue to other people in ways other people may not even see. And that's the way to introduce the concept of, of presumption of entitlement, entitlement and privilege. And one of the, the, the illustrations I would use is that if we took all of the men in the room and all the women in the room and denied women the right to vote on what time we're going to have lunch, the men's vote would be more powerful uh, or any combination that you want. But the important thing is to take a look at the fact that if the isms have existed and persist in our society, then we also have to take a look at the fact that some people benefit in ways they may not even understand and know. Once you've set that stage, then we can move to really understanding that there's resistance to change and understanding that this work of diversity is not about making the students change or it's not about making the community change to us, but how do we adapt to the community in ways that really serves them. And we, at this point, they'll start treating their cultures as assets rather than deficits. So once we've had that conversation and done some reading and some reflecting and having deep conversations, then we're ready to really start taking a look at the tools of cultural proficiency 
And this is significant because it engages people in, in gathering data. And so we're going to walk you through that real quickly. Once we've... Uh, oh, I, oh, oh okay. Go ahead, Randy. Uh, there's a wonderful video. If you, I know you have access to, to TED, uh, Technology, Entertainment, and Design, TED.com. Uh, this five minute, excuse me, this 17 minute video by Jackson Katz is absolutely spellbinding in being able to unpack uh, the isms and privilege entitlement. And he's a former Marine, he's a video maker. Um, the film that th this one is from, it's, it's on TED, it's easy to access, is about gender violence. And I take the first five minutes and use that to introduce the concept of privilege entitlement. And trust me, if you go on and, and download it and take a look at it, if you've not seen it before, um, it'll be quite enlightening and really a good tool in your toolbox. So the next slide is really how do you counter the guiding, how do you counter the barriers and you counter the barriers with the nine guiding principles. And we're going to just put the nine up real quickly so you can see them. Uh, there's uh, five on this slide, I think, and then four. And we don't have time today to go into each one of these, but in our workshops we would um, these are the core values of uh, cultural proficiency and they're everything from recognizing that culture is a predominant force in our lives. We cannot not have culture. It's everything that we do. And in, in organizations, it's how we know how decisions are made. Uh, it's how we know what's going on around here. Uh, culture is how we identify with uh, our groups. Uh, it's how we respect the unique cultural needs uh, of our individuals and, and group identities. And then if you go on to um, the next slide, uh, we see there are four others. And it's really about understanding the, the best of all worlds, uh, our own cultural needs as well as the cultural needs of others. And certainly when we are in schools and we bring together multiple cultures, all in the same environment. It's about a high value that we hold for the different cultural groups. And really the, the fact that overcoming the barrier of unawareness of the need to adapt is certainly adapting to um, the fact that parents have to be bicultural in nature. They have their own home culture and then they have to know the culture of the school system. So, as Randy said, it's the culture of the school that needs to be adapting to our community rather than asking the community to adapt to the schools. So, using these nine guiding principles help uh, counter then those barriers. And then we come to the third tool, which is the continuum. And we're just going to have to move through what the points on the continuum are uh, just to acquaint you with it. There are three points that are negative, and there are three points that are positive on the left side of the continuum. I can build on that. The first three that are in red are informed by the, uh, the barriers, and the three that are in green are informed by the guiding principles. And that becomes an important part of it because the next activity, which we're going to show you quickly, is one that's in the book. It's in lesson plan format. But we actually gather data from the uh, participants, and th then we can group them into these two categories. And it really becomes instructive to take a look at the climate in the school or school district. So if you can imagine a room, uh, any room, training room. So on a wall, we put up six large poster papers going from left to right. So on the far left side, we have cultural destructiveness. So Mitch, we're going to go through the next six slides pretty quickly. So cultural destructiveness on the left side. And we ask folks to write on small post-its. Uh, examples of what they might see or hear or programs that they would know about. And then we, um, within their own organization, by the employees, not students or parents, unless the parents are employees in that organization. And then we give examples that you see here on the slide and others, actual things we've heard or seen in districts where we've worked. And then folks write those, their examples on a post-it and then at the end of the activity, they come up and put their post-its on those six large poster papers. So uh, cultural destructiveness is the most hostile and the negative, most negative. Uh, you hear these kinds of quotes. Then incapacity is next. It's about dismissing or blaming. 
and uh, just putting folks aside and not accounting for them uh, and their cultural needs. And then cultural blindness uh, is the next one. And it's, it's really about pretending or not see or unable to see culture. It's kind of like, let's just all get along. Uh, what's wrong with the way we're doing things right now? And um, treating folks uh, just alike and really not seeing culture, really just being invisible to cultural needs. Randy, you want to pick it up there? Yes, the, now we move to the constructive side, this pre-competence uh, and having people gather data here also, things people have said, things people have done, policies and practices. This is the pre-competence, beginning to know what we don't know becomes a really important part of the data collection. The next one is cultural competence. This is actually things that are happening in the school, you know, things that are observable, that are constructive, that are positive. And then cultural proficiency uh, is what they call the advocacy, it's future focus. What becomes significant now at this point, we, we have everybody come up and put their uh, post-its uh, on those six sheets. And our experience is that they tend to be tipped to the negative more than the positive. Um, and irrespective of what the distribution is, you get, you get a represent, representation across the, uh, the six points in the continuum. It becomes a really important activity because it's a climate profile for the school. And by the way, we also ask people on the left side, any, any illustration you have there is not to put the speaker's name. Anything on the right side, it's okay to do that. But at this point now, we, we have a real good uh, attention to what the profile of the school is and are able then to move into a consideration of the essential elements as planning guides for how they move constructively in, in the future direction. So once we've collected the data around the, uh, that tool, we use the um, activity then to move into the fourth tool, which are the five essential elements. And this is really the action phase of the four tools. Um, these are the five essential elements. If you notice, they all start with verbs. Assessing cultural knowledge, valuing diversity, managing the dynamics of difference, adapting to diversity, and institutionalizing uh, cultural knowledge. We're going to show you how these action verbs actually fit on the rubric. Um, when you registered, you were sent um, by email a rubric, one of the rubrics from uh, one of the books. There are rubrics in several of the books. This one happens to be the curriculum instruction rubric. And the rubrics are like roadmaps uh, that will guide you in developing action toward the right side of the continuum. And one of the things we want to caution you about the rubrics in our books, they're not developmental in the sense of you want to start on the far left side and move along. You don't want to go from cultural destructiveness to cultural incapacity to cultural blindness. You want to leapfrog. If you're on the left side of the continuum, you want to really leap way over to the right side. So uh, Mitch, on that next slide, uh, you actually see the, the rubric here, and the, um, what you see on the left side will be the five essential elements. You see two of them here, and then if you move toward the right side in the shaded area, you'll see that that's where the essential element uh, is actually in operation or in action under cultural competence. Yeah, one point that I'll make with your rubric, if after this webinar you take a look at the rubric and it makes sense to you and you take it back to your school tomorrow, let me talk about the inappropriate use of the rubric and the appropriate use of the rubric. The inappropriate use of the rubric is you go back to your school tomorrow and talk to someone at the school and you find something under cultural destructiveness is where they are. And so you go up to that person and say, you know, I was with Dolores and Randy Lindsay last night and I learned this rubric around cultural efficiency and it seems to me that you're culturally destructive. That's the inappropriate <laughs> use of rubric. Uh, the appropriate use of rubric is if you see a behavior from a colleague or yourself, then look to the right for behaviors that are uh, appropriate to moving forward. And so that's really the purpose of the, of the rubric is to see current behavior and then to see behavior that's more appropriate, pre-competent, competent, and proficient. And the right-hand side of the, of the rubric is, in fact, developmental. The left-hand side is, of course, not. But uh, we've had great success with this as people being able to take this work and go deeply with it. I will point out the left-hand side, if you can see there, is informed by the barriers. The right-hand side is informed by the guiding principles. Um, we've not been in a school yet where people don't have a core value for all students learning. And so how do you build on that in such a way that we change the conversation from all students learning to all educators educating? 
And that's really the, the shift in, in conversation that we're trying to generate with schools we're working with and finding in, in professional learning settings, people are quite amenable to that and quite supportive of that, if not in fact already there. Other shifts that we see in our work is that people move from the left side of the continuum by talking about subgroups. Now that is a typical term used in assessment, but we invite folks to rather than describe students as subgroups, talk about them as student groups or demographic groups, and that moves you to the right side of the continuum. Instead of talking about students as being underperforming students, talk about them toward the right side of the continuum as being uh, students that are underserved or need to be served differently. So typically what we see from the post-its on the activity earlier using the continuum is that we see blaming students and their parents and their communities on the left side to a shift toward uh, us, we, taking responsibility on the right side of the continuum. We can and we will toward the right side of the continuum. And so what we want to see on the next slide. OK, well, yeah, I'm sorry. I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you a question about that, because this seems to be a real crux. I think it's something that that could really benefit, you know, everybody. So let's say that, you know, that you observed me and as, and I'm, let's say I'm a teacher in one of the schools and you observe me or, or and you're a teacher in one of the schools and I go up to a person and, and, and I say, you know, you're an Asian, so you should really be good in math. I'm disappointed in you. OK, and then I walk away. OK, so that, that seems to me to be on that left side. OK, I mean, it's kind of a, it, so what you don't say to me, hey, that's what, what do you say to me under those circumstances? <laughs> Depends on how well I know you. <laughs> well, OK, so you're, you're a teacher with me and, you know, we work together. Yeah, I think it's really important in that kind of situation is um, If the person said that to me or I said that to that person? Well, you observed me oh. saying that to one of the students. Yeah. Okay, and now you're not going to say, hey, you know something, I was with, um, you know, Randall and Dolores yeah. Lindsay last night, and they told me that's really culturally destructive behavior, and you, you know, that was really bad, and you have to change. That's not what you would say. Yeah. So what I, would you I would, say? I would, in fact, I've had that happen most recently uh, last week, only it wasn't Asian and white. It was uh, gay lesbian, um, and in my in my setting with this person, it was an elementary school, and I said, "Don't you realize that that's stereotypic?" And the person looked at me and it was quite surprised. Um, it's one thing to try to gauge. Anytime you confront a behavior like that, expect that a person is going to be is going to be taken off guard for a minute, um, mm -hmm. and explain why I thought it was stereotypic in this particular case. Uh, and, and the person was upset because they saw a lesbian teacher had her her wife's photograph on her desk. I thought that was inappropriate. Mm -hmm. And so we had a real interesting conversation for about 30, 35 minutes. And, um, you know, I, I'm not sure that the behavior is going to change real quickly, but at least the behavior was challenged. And that mm -hmm. becomes a really important part of the conversation. What I tried to do is not make judgment other than the fact that, you know, obviously I was thinking the behavior is inappropriate, but not to shut down, you know, and, and get into a downward spiral of, of blaming but just in, in, entered into conversation so we can continue the conversation. When I go back in two weeks, it'll be interesting, you know, because I'll, I'll seek him out to, to continue the conversation. It becomes very, very important. Uh, and that's why we start those first activities of yeah. having conversation and developing community before we get into these kind of conversations. That's a great illustration of that. Okay. Now, I, I know uh, we're coming up to the hour. Uh, also, yeah. I'll bring myself down, um, and I'll bring the slides up and let you proceed. But I thought that was a, a uh, you know, it's a, a segue because you brought up what people not to yeah. say. And yeah. And using the five essential elements really ha help shape uh, what we call it, you know, what do you say when? And uh, using leverage points, um, these are the, the real how to's. Uh, what have we done or not done to cause the patterns that persist? How can we recognize what is going on in order to? effectively intervene. These are questions you ask about what is it we need to do and where do we need to enter the system? Um, what is it, uh, you know, that we can can continue to think about and what are beliefs that allow the results to persist? So it's breaking up those continuing patterns that persist. 
the the next slide that we have is really about culturally proficient practices and how they focus on it's it's really the moral purpose of the work and focusing on closing the achievement gaps and it takes a critical mass of folks doing that and uh, we would advocate for using the the four tools of cultural proficiency uh, as as one approach it's not the only approach but it's the the approach that we use we're going to close um, our part of it, Mitch, and then turn it back over to you. Just Margaret Wheatley's words again, uh, because when communities come together to do this work of equity and access and really believing uh, that we can educate all students, uh, it makes for a pretty powerful work in the community. And this is what she says about that. There's no power greater than a community discovering what it cares about. Ask what's possible rather than asking what's wrong. Notice what you care about and assume that many others share your dreams. Be brave enough to start a conversation that matters. Talk to people you know, talk to people you don't know, and talk to people you never talk to. Be intrigued by the differences that you hear and expect to be surprised. Treasure curiosity more than certainty. Invite in everyone who cares to work on what's possible. Acknowledge that everyone is an expert about some things and know that creative solutions come from new connections. Remember, you don't fear people whose story you know. Real listening always brings people closer together and trust that meaningful conversation can change your world. Rely on human goodness and stay together. We want to thank you very much uh, for everyone joining us today. And Mitch is going to share with you uh, some other ways that Corin can support your learning. Well, and thank you, Randy and Dolores, and uh, thank everyone for joining us today. You know, this is a this the whole issue of cultural proficiency. It is a voyage, and even though I myself have, have been very interested in cultural proficiency for probably 20, 25 years. You know, every time I hear something, I learn. And it, it, you, um, and, and, and this was this really helped me with a few things that that I've been working on for myself. So, so thank you, and thank everybody. For, uh, th I want to thank you all for joining us today. Um, if you're interested in um, in let me let me go to the correct slide. Uh, if you're interested in beginning or continuing your work in cultural proficiency with Randy and Dolores, there are several ways that you can do that. Um, they and their co-authors have been developing an entire body of PD work focused on cultural proficiency through Corin over the last 20 years. And uh, one place to start is with the cultural proficiency line of books, which focuses on professional learning for teachers, school leaders, administrators, and support staff. There are over a dozen cultural proficiency books available on a variety of topics, ranging from English language learners, coaching, culturally proficient leadership, using PLCs to advance cultural proficiency, Common Core, and more. You can get any of these books through Corwin.com, and they're also available as ebooks e through the Amazon Kindle Store, iTunes, and ebooks.com. So, in, in addition to uh, the books, there are also four online uh, professional development courses available through Corin. Uh, for those of you who'd like more flexibility or multimedia-based learning, uh, these e-courses come in 30-hour and 5-hour formats, depending on how deep of a dive you'd like uh, into each topic. Uh, the e-courses include videos, reading excerpts, and practice exercises to guide you and your team through each module. If you'd like to enroll your entire staff or enroll your leadership teams from different buildings in your district, you can get discounts through Corwin. Uh, just tell them Mitch sent you. Uh, actually, you don't have to tell them that. They, they give you the discount anyhow. Um, and then for uh, author con consulting, Randy and Dolores have also partnered with Corwin to develop a multi-year implementation program to support cultural proficiency in schools and districts. And it's not just the culture, you know, the cultural proficiency is, 
as important as it is, just keep in mind that it also improves your outcomes because it has a dramatic effect on student learning and also in, in, uh, set the satisfaction of everyone, everybody in the school and district. Uh, they and their team of co-authors and colleagues can work with your staff one-on-one -on -one to build your organization's internal capacity. Um, and this fully customizable program can help support and sustain your current equity work for lasting change. You can contact Corwin if you want more information or for a customized proposal. And, um, and then finally, you can join fellow educators from across the country who are focused on cultural proficiency at this year's International Cultural Proficiency Institute. Uh, keynote speakers include uh, Trudy Ariaga, Raymond Terrell, Gail Thompson, and Kikanza Nuri Robbins. Uh, uh, Corwin has arranged for an exclusive discount for today's webinar studies uh, with the promo code April Webinar. And if you go to www.corwin.com 2001CPI, um, you can get uh, more information. And don't forget that discount code, which is April Webinar. And then coming up for, from Corbin on April 19th, there's Visible Learning for Literacy with Douglas Fisher and Nancy Frey. And then on uh, May 9th is Lynn Sharrett and uh, B. Planche with Leading Collaborative Learning. So uh, I, you know, I know I mentioned earlier that uh, that I got a lot out of this webinar. I hope everybody else did. It's a it's such an important topic, and uh, most of us don't even realize the cultural blinders that we all have. Um, the work that um, Lindsay and, and Dolores are do that sorry Randall and Dolores are doing is. Um, it, it is so critical for all of us moving forward. So it's um, it's five minutes past the past the time we were supposed to end. Um, please feel free to contact us at EdChat Interactive or the team at Corwin, and uh, we'll be more than happy to answer your questions. If if you don't if you have questions, we'll have we'll archive this webinar and we'll also be sending you the slides. Um, so uh, I'll be signing off. This is Mitch Weisberg from EdChat Interactive, and I really hope that I get to see you at a future event. Good evening.